I okay. Uh, I would like to call to order the special meeting of the Park and Recreation Commission. Um, the agenda item tonight is a, is a presentation by um, staff with respect to, and I lost the exact name of it, but it's the, the paratransit program that is operated by Park and Recreation. Um, so unless I've left something out here, uh, it's, it's over to you, Sheila. Um, so thank you, um, Chair Massey and members of the commission. Um, at your last commission meeting, um, we mentioned the Get Around um, Senior Transportation Program. Um, and there was an interest in having um, some, just a back, some background information about the program brought to this commission. So um, that's our plan tonight. Uh, we have a short presentation and I'll turn it over to our community services manager, Bob Palacio and his staff from the senior center uh, to fill you all in. Thank you, Sheila. Bob Palacio, community services manager. Good evening, uh, Chair Massey and commissioners. Um, as Sheila said at the last meeting of this body, uh, we, did, we did have a caller who called in uh, regarding the get around program and you had asked for a little bit of background. So I wanna provide that. Um, I also have Carolyn Chevelle, who is sort of the brains behind the operation here over at the Senior Center. And uh, if, if we have some specific questions, uh, she, would, she would be probably more helpful than, than I would. So um, what I'd like to do before I get into the presentation is just um, as a reminder, the city of San Mateo is super fortunate uh, that we actually have a city council appointed um, uh, senior citizens commission as well. Um, and their scope of what they actually look at and, and are involved with is much more narrow than what this commission is. And um, that being said, something like the get around program, which is a specific to seniors program, uh, is something that we actually uh, talk with them in more detail about. And I think moving forward, even when we have um, some of these programs that might be more specific around seniors or, or, or other areas, I'll do my best to make sure that uh, we give you at least a, a yearly update um, so that you're aware of what's going on as well. Okay, fair enough. Okay, so I'll get right into the, the presentation so that um, we can, all right, everyone see that? Yes. All right. So the city of San Mateo, we actually partner with uh, Sierra Yellow Cab. We enter into a contract with them. Uh, and it serves uh, San Mateo senior populations throughout the city. So rather than go through like, um, you know, one of the Ubers or things like that, we felt it best to, to stick with Sarah Yellow Cab or senior population feels much more comfortable um, getting into a yellow cab rather than maybe someone's personal vehicle. There's also more safety measures that are in place and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. So stats, 841 current members. Uh, remember, this thing started about three and a half years ago or so, uh, and prior to COVID, we were on a very steep incline. We were getting probably uh, 30 to 50 new members a month at one point. Uh, it was really, really rapidly climbing. Uh, $5 cards, there's approximately 85 rides a month, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little about, bit about what those cards are. And then the $2 card, there's approximately about 99 rides a month right now. The $2 card is a, a, a recreation fee assistance program card. So um, seniors who qualify are actually able to fill out an application for recreation fee assistance. And rather than taking a $5 uh, a ride uh, off of their card, it takes $2 uh, off of their card. Um, the annual program budget uh, is $150,000. We've had a number of different ways it's been funded. It started with Measure S sort of moved into the general fund. And recently we've been fortunate enough to receive a grant um, from CCAG, which is the city's county's uh, association of governments in San Mateo County. And, uh, and so we were able to, to get funding for them for uh, basically for two years. So that's been uh, a really nice, a nice thing. So who qualifies? You have to be a San Mateo resident. You can't live outside of the city of San Mateo and you have to be at least age 60. And so th those are the people that qualify. Okay, cost. There is no upfront cost to, uh, to become a member. Um, registration is free. Uh, as I mentioned before, 
uh, $5 per trip or $2 per trip for those who qualify for RFA, which is a really good deal. Um, participants can either pay with cash or credit card directly to the cab company when taking the ride. And the remaining balance for the ride is billed to the city of San Mateo by Sarah Cab. So if you take a $18 cab ride and you're, you qualify for recreation fee assistance, you're only gonna pay $2 for that trip and the city's gonna pick up the remaining balance. So it's a really good deal. It's very highly subsidized, but it's awesome for our senior population to be able to get them um, either shopping or to medical appointments or, or, or whatever it might be. Okay, the referral process. So patrons must register either in person, ma uh, mail in or online. So there's lots of ways they can do it. Um, Loliana and, uh, and Carolyn who are on this call, um, are also, uh, you know, see a lot of the seniors who come in and, and ask questions about the Get Around program, and it's fairly easy to get them registered. Once registered, each participant will be issued a preloaded card with eight rides. So they're actually going to get like a little credit card, and they'll have eight rides on it. Each month, that card will be loaded automatically with those eight rides for the month. Rides not taken the previous month do not roll over. So basically, you get eight rides for that month. Okay, where can I go? All rides must begin or end in the city of San Mateo. So basically, if you're uh, if you live in the city of San Mateo and you want to go to a doctor's appointment and your doctor is in San Carlos, we will pick you up in San Mateo and drive you to San Carlos. And then when you take your return trip, you need to get picked up and brought back to the city of San Mateo. We can't pick you up in San Carlos and then take you, you know, to Pacifica or something like that. So you have to either start or end. Destinations must be between the cities of San Mateo, Belmont, Burlingame, Foster City, all of our surrounding cities. We also include the Veterans Hospital, Menlo Park in Palo Alto, and Stanford affiliated medical offices in Palo Alto. We do see a lot of our, our trips are for medical appointments. Um, but the cool thing is it, it really does allow our senior population to be independent. Um, you know, they 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 would rather take a, a cab in the get around program, then, you know, constantly maybe bar, uh, you know, be calling a, a son or a daughter or, or a family member to give them rides. So it really, really does work for their independence. Okay, scheduling. We recommend senior makes a phone call 30 minutes before they need a ride. Um, and then uh, drivers will arrive and um, rides are available 24 seven. So they can, they can do this at any you know, hour of the day, as early as they want or as late as they want, which is great. Okay, pro, uh, COVID precaution. So one of the advantages of being with Yellow Cab as opposed to you know Uber or Lyft or one of the other the, the companies is there's a little little bit higher standard and you a little bit more controls on the actual vehicles and the drivers. So the vehicles are sanitized by the drivers between every ride. Uh, both driver and passengers are required to wear masks at all times. And then there there are plastic dividers in these cabs between the driver and the passengers. Um, which is really important. So seniors feel a lot more comfortable maybe than, than again, in, in one of the, the Ubers or the Lyfts. And then we have, um, we have our, um, our links and people can go to our city website um, and look at the, um, you know, how to actually sign up for the Get Around program, what it's all about. Um, I, think, I think currently um, the caller that called in um, that sort of triggered this conversation um, had mentioned maybe the possibility of uh, serving disabled uh, residents here in San Mateo under the age of 60 and adding that to the program. We're obviously going to, you know, take a look at that and see what the viability is and, and um, you know, think about whether or not we can actually handle that administratively and, um, and financially. Um, so currently, 60 plus must be a resident here in San Mateo, and it is a terrific program. I can tell you guys that um, this program has been copycatted by a lot of neighboring cities. You know, instead of uh, people starting from scratch, they literally took um, the guidelines and our policies and procedures, cut the, the logo off the top and added their own. Um, so, you know, when, when you're doing something really well and you're doing something right, you're sort of innovative, um, you know, the, the best uh, form of flattery is, is people copying and it has been a program that has been duplicated um, a number of times uh, in, in other cities. So we're very, very proud of it. Um, Carolyn, I didn't want to I didn't want to leave you um, out of the conversation. If there's anything that you would like to add 
uh, or, or even Liliana uh, regarding the, uh, the get around program, please, please do so. Thank you, Bob. Um, it, just one thing is, it sounds like a lot of people for 841 people, a lot of people don't use it. They say they just want it because in case they need it. It's a, it's a nice little card to have in their back pocket in case something happens and they need a ride and can't find a friend, as Bob mentioned, or something, but they may not use it, but it's there in case they knew it. And so we have a lot of people sign up for that. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing program that many people come in and from all, all cities want to come in and, and uh, sign up and we have to tell them it's only for San Mateo residents, sorry. Hi right. everyone. Go uh, this, ahead, Lily. this is Liliana. Um, my camera isn't working, but um, I just wanted to add uh, that yes, um, a lot of the rights that we are seeing are for um, you know medical appointments or errands and things like that. But recently we actually did have um, a handful of people call us to let us know that they'd like to um, register for the program because they, they have plans over the holidays and this would be their transportation um, to get to, to their plans for the holidays, which I think is a great, um, you know, great use of the program. Thank you. All right. And, and, and I'm sorry, Bob, if I can just add just a little bit of, and by the way, a background. <clears throat> so this was a program that was actually very, very um, supported by our former city manager, Larry Patterson. Um, he felt really strongly that um, one of the needs that, keep, that kept coming up in the senior um, population was the need for transportation. Um, and we looked at a number of different alternatives, everything from, the, from Uber and Lyft to try to do some sort of shuttle um, to a bus program. And really, I think what we found was that seniors feel most um, uh, you know, they, they feel better when they can be picked up at their home. There's somebody there that can maybe even come to the door um, and help them come out and then take them where they want to go and then bring them back home. Um, there is an opportunity that if there are several people that um, are going to go to the same place that they can sort of team up together um, and get several people that can go to um, one particular location. I think the other thing um, that I know Larry felt really strongly about is that um, there had been a lot of frustration about the availability of ready wheels. And um, that while it is a county program, um, that sometimes it was really hard to get them to respond. Um, there seemed to be a waiting list um, as far as um, when people could sign up. And also, um, at least at the time, ready wheels was more focused on medical appointments. The one advantage to our program is that seniors can use this transportation for any reason. They can use it to go to the movies, they can go visit family, they can go to a medical appointment, they can do go shopping. And so it was not limited only to uh, medical appointments. And so um, he was a very strong proponent of it. Um, when the um, San Mateo residents passed Measure S a number of years ago, that extra continuation of the um, sales tax, he felt very strongly that this, that that particular source should be used to help fund the program. And that's how um, we were able to fund it. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of background. I'll turn it back to Bob and his staff in case commissioners have any um, specific questions they want to they want to ask. Thank you, Sheila. Yeah, any questions? Uh, we'd be more than happy to try to answer. I know you have your regular meeting, so we we'll, we'll try to be quick. Okay. Um, uh, fellow commissioners, do, do any of you have questions that you'd like to ask on this? I have a question, and I believe Commissioner Holm has a question. Um, well, what, since you, you spoke up first, why don't you go first? Great. Um, so I think this is probably for Bob, but any of you could ask. Um, do you know how well known this program is? You were, um, I think Carolyn said that there were a lot of people signed up who maybe aren't using the program and they're, you know, it's like just in case, which is great. Um, but I'd never heard of it, although I'm certainly not the right demographic for it. Um, so I'm just, I'm curious, like how it's kind of advertised or publicized. Um, I think it's a great program. And I just, I wanna make sure that everyone who needs it uses it. 
Um, and then I'm just curious how it works in terms of payment. So you said they have a card and it's either $5 or $2. Does the cab company just sort of know that they're on board with this process or kind of how are the mechanics of it working out? Why don't we do this? I'll take the first part and then Carolyn and Lily can take this, the second one. Great. So the first part is the program, when we, when we first initially started the program, the program was growing at such a, a fast rate. There were so many people signing up and starting to use the program. We needed to be actually really careful about how much we promoted it because you know we're, we're, we're kind of restricted by the amount of dollars and how many rides we could actually fund. And so we, we were very careful in, in just doing some targeted marketing and not blowing it out to the entire city. Um, and what we were seeing pre-COVID is that the numbers were, were increasing so fast and the signups were happening and the usages were actually going up, those numbers and the dollars that we were actually spending, we were getting right to $100,000. We actually had to go back to city council and ask for additional funding, which they said yes to. And so for us to kind of promote a, a program that you know we were gonna have to put a cap on, we were, we were very mindful of that. So maybe one of the reasons you haven't seen it like promoted all over the place is because we didn't want to create this disappointment where you know now you're just going to have this really long waiting list. And so we've had a steady flow of people, the word of mouth in the senior community has been, you know, been really active and so we haven't had any problem getting people to sign up and then actually use the service. We think that once uh, we kind of continue to kind of come out of COVID we're going to be right up against that $150,000 expenditure for each year. So that's the first part. And then the second part, Carolyn and Lily, if you wanted to talk a little bit about how the billing happens really quickly. The, the, the seniors are all given, like as Lily said, a little credit card. And so it's just when they go into the cab, the cab will just swipe it like a regular credit card. And that'll just, and then they just pay the $5 there or the $2. And then the company then sends us an invoice for the rest of the amount of money. And so, and one thing is if they do go out of the district, they do have to pay the extra fee. If they go to Millbrae to the airport or to San Francisco, they pay the $5 to Burlingame and then they just pay the rest of it to the cab driver there. And so it's very easy for them. It's just like a credit card. All right, so hopefully I answered those two. And then I think Commissioner Holm, you had a question as well? Yes. Um, it, did I hear you correctly, Bob, that you said that they had basically eight ride minimum per month that they paid for? Yes. So there's no option for someone to sign up and say, take two rides a month. There's no penalty for not taking the, the two rides. So there's no upfront cost. And so you're going to get loaded eight rides on your card. If you only use two, there's no penalty for that. That's fine. Okay. But you said the card expired each month. The, no, the card will get reloaded each month. So oh. if you use six, you're going to, you know, when the first of the month hits, you're going to get another eight on your card. You wouldn't okay. have, if I didn't use, if I only use two in October, I'm not going to have 14 now in November. I'm still going to have the eight. So whether or not, whether you use the, the eight that you have in a month, they don't carry over to the next month. It just resets to eight. So the eight, so the um, eight rides a month is a limit. Is that it? Is that how yes. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. And this is Liliana again. Um, and even if, you know, in cases where a senior um, uses up their eight rides and say, they take a ninth ride, what happens is we don't want to deny that senior that ride. So what we do is we deduct that one ride from the next month. And so um, the next month they start with seven rides. And so I will contact the, at the beginning of the, of the month, I'll contact um, the cab company and ask, hey, did we have anyone go over? And then I will contact the, the seniors personally and say, hey, just a heads up, you're starting the month with seven rides because this is what happened. And that way they don't, get to not take that ride because they've you know used up their rights okay so if they use two they're recharged two the following month if they use eight the full eight then they recharge the full eight yes. no they it gets recharged it they get yes. eight rides every month whether they use two or they use eight every okay. month they start with eight yeah so if they use two then the next month they would have uh 14 no 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 They'll the rights don't carry over 
So if you have each month, you're going to get eight rides on your ticket. If I only use two of those rides, yeah, you're still going to reset to eight yeah. on the first. So you. But how much do I pay each time? You'll you only pay per ride. So when you get into the cab, a senior gets into the cab, they would pay the the you know the, they would swipe the card, and that would be their two dollar ride if they were an RFA person, and then the rest of that would be billed to the city. Okay. Can I clarify? I think there's a misunderstanding. So I think the card that they swipe for the program is not, it's not like a debit card where they have a certain like a amount of cash. That's what I, right? that's it's what just, I was thinking. Yeah. Right. It's yeah. just a, you get the ride for that rate and then you pay separately you pay the, the $5. Right. Okay. So the card's the opportunity to take eight rides. Yeah, the, exactly. And the, and the card, when you're swiping the card, it actually tells the system to then send the invoice to us to bill us for the, the rest of that ride less the two dollars or five dollars that the senior paid gotcha okay i think it's a great program thank you thank you thanks bob you're very welcome any other questions or, or comments uh from the commission on this okay well then um I, I'm ready to uh, uh, adjourn this. I, I realized that I neglected to ask Giovanna to uh, call the roll before this, which is that necessary, Giovanna? That Chair Massey, sorry, my, my microphone wasn't working. Yeah, we can, we can take the roll for the regular meeting, Sheila, if that's okay, since this one already took place. Yeah, we'll just note um, the commissioners um, that are here um, for the special meeting. Um, but I did want to note that we do have one member of the public who raised their hand um, to speak um, on this item. And so I think I would ask that before you close a special meeting um, that Giovanna announce the person who had raised their hand on this item. Uh, yeah, by all means, why don't we go ahead and do that? Thank you, Sheila. So Ryan Motzek had his hand raised. Ryan, if you could unmute yourself. Hi there. I uh, I was just checking to make sure that I was at the right meeting. Looks like I wasn't, so I'll sit patiently till the next. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so Giovanna, is are, is there any other member of the public who wants to? comment on this on this topic that they get around a program i do not see any additional hands raised chair massey okay well then i'm going to adjourn the special meeting and um, i will call to order the uh, regular meeting of the park and recreation commission and would everyone please uh, stand mute your microphones for sorry for the pledge of allegiance I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, um, uh, Giovanna, would you call the roll, please? I would be happy to, Chair Massey. Commissioner Fields? Present. Commissioner Holm? Commissioner Holm? Here. Thank you. Commissioner Wolnick? Here. Okay, uh, I'm here and I understand that Commissioner Held is uh, absent and excused. Yes. Okay. Um, due to the physical distancing protocols in place at this time, we continue to encourage public participation remotely. Information on how to provide public comment is explained at the top and bottom of the published agenda. There are two ways to participate. Join the Zoom meeting by clicking on the link at the top of the agenda. 
use the raise your hand button to be called on at the appropriate time. Please unmute yourself only when called upon. Alternatively, phone in participation can be done by calling 408-638-0968 with the conference ID 8813615. Eight three three two, passcode six five nine eight five three. Press star nine to raise your hand to be called on, and star six to unmute. These options for public comment will remain available until I uh, call on into the uh, public comment period. Um, okay, the next item on our agenda is uh, the uh, consent calendar, uh, and the one item on there is approval of minutes from our October 6, 2021 meeting. Does anyone have any changes to propose to the minutes? Uh, hearing none, I would call for uh, a motion and a, and a second for approval of the minutes. I'll move to approve the minutes. I'll second. Uh, okay. Um, Giovanna, would you uh, do a roll call vote, please? Yes, Chair Massey. Um, Commissioner Wolnick? Yes. Commissioner Holm? Yes. Commissioner Fields? Yes. Chair Massey? Uh, yes. Thank you, motion has passed. Okay, very good. Um, okay, uh, at this time, um, members uh, of the public wishing to comment on any item not appearing on tonight's agenda may address the commission. State law prevents the commission from taking action on any matter not on the agenda. Your comments may be referred to staff for follow-up. Public comment is limited to a total of 15 minutes. However, an opportunity for additional public comment may be provided later in the agenda. Uh, tonight's new business agenda item is parks, open spaces, and facility naming policy. Uh, Giovanna, do we have uh, any member of the public wishing to uh, comment to the commission on uh, an item not on that agenda. Yes, we do, Chair Massey. We have Ryan Mopsek. Ryan, Hi. if you could unmute yourself. Hi, how are you all doing tonight? Um, thank you for uh, taking the time to uh, host this meeting. Um, apologize, it's a little loud where I'm at. Um, the reason why I'm, uh, I'm speaking is obvious. Uh, some of you might recognize me. I'm always here to talk about skate parks. Um, I'm really, really happy uh, that we've got this $400,000 to fix the existing parks. I definitely think we need to also think about getting a new park in San Mateo. And most importantly, I really, really would like for us to have a listening session or some sort of discussion. It's been over a year of these meetings that uh, the skateboarding community has attended. We really haven't had any sort of conversations. Some of you have been so kind to take the time and speak with me in private. Really appreciate that. Some of you, for some reason, said you wouldn't want to speak with me in private, um, saying it's a violation of the Brown Act, which it is not. Um, but the conversation is how things get done. Communication is important. I think it's dysfunctional to not have conversations, and we need to have a sit down and talk. And 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 you guys need to, uh, you know, listen to us, and we need to listen to you. So please take the time to have the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does does staff uh, have any comment on uh, this? Uh, public input. And not at this time. Okay. Okay. Uh, Massey, we do have one other member of the public. Well, then let's let's have have that individual uh, um, unmute. Patrick, can you please unmute yourself? Patrick, are you there? Can you unmute yourself? I think, we... oh, there we go. Hey, oh, hey there, sorry about that. 
Um, I just wanted to second uh, what Ryan said about the skate parks. Um, it seems we might be having technical difficulties. Patrick, are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear not, you now. I'm not sure why it keeps kicking me off. Uh, I was just saying, I wanted to second what Ryan was saying about the skate parks. I was at the Shoreview Skate Park today. As great as it is, it's definitely um, noticeable that San Mateo needs, needs more facilities. So I just wanted to kind of second what Ryan was saying and kind of hope for the opportunity to open that, that conversation up uh, with you all and, and the city. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Okay, Giovanna, do we have anyone else? We do, we have two more members of the public. The first is phone number ending in 736. If you can please unmute yourself, caller ending in 736. Hi, thank you guys. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Okay, this is Tony uh, from Border Town Skate Parks. And uh, uh, I like just to uh, pass by here and then remind you guys one more time or several more times that um, all the parks we have in San Mateo or near this area, it's outdated. Um, I feel that uh, I, I heard Patrick saying that he's brave to be at the park. That park has been outdated for ages and um, we're, we're surrounded of golf course and all that stuff. And I, uh, Apparently, we don't have any uh, outlet for ourselves, and sometimes we try to skate in um, public spaces, and uh, it doesn't go well. I guess the, you know, uh, pedestrians and all, they will complain they were skating, but we have no uh, place to skate. And um, I would love to hear something about it, or at least talk about it, um, a new plan, so we can... Uh, at least have some uh, hope on that case. And uh, I would like to thank you guys for the opportunity to be speaking. And honestly, I've built skate parks all over the United States uh, and outside too. And I do believe this is the right thing to do for us and uh, for San Mateo too, especially with the Olympics and all that. I think we should just try to catch up a little bit with with California and everything else that's going on around and having a safe space so we can practice that, it'll be great. Um, thank you guys for the opportunity and uh, have a good night, you all. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Giovanni, you said you had somebody else? Yes, we do. Michael Manides, if you can unmute yourself. Hello, this is Mike Manitas here. Uh, I run the skateboard instruction program through the Parks and Rec Department for the City of San Mateo. And you also have probably heard my voice at just about every meeting recently involving the parks. So I also want to lobby on be behalf of the skateboard community uh, to make sure it's understood that we, especially the elders in the community that work in skateboarding on a local level have an opportunity to have a say in how the money gets spent uh, when they are doing the upgrade and the renewal to Shoreview or wherever it happens. That's all. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Giovanna, do we have anybody else? We do, Chair Massey. There are two additional hands raised at this time. Andy, you are first. If you can unmute yourself, please. Hello, this is Andy. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi there. Um, I have also uh, lived in San Mateo my whole life. I am also a lifelong skateboarder. Um, I've been going to city council meetings since I was a child, literally. Um, and I've been hearing about talks of building a skate park since I was a child. I'm almost 40 now, and I still am just hearing talks. Um, we were promised a permanent large skate park that was a lie, and then we just got plazas, two of them, when we were promised the third, that never happened. 
And then now we're, I'm hearing of uh, repairs on parks that don't necessarily need a repair, but just weren't built correctly in the first place. And instead of getting three plazas, we should have just had one large, correctly built skate park. And as you know, I'll be honest, I've lost complete trust in the city of San Mateo. I've seen cities all around the Bay Area get skate parks and the amount of development I've seen in the peninsula across, let's say my 30 years has been crazy and still no skate parks. So really I'm curious, I'd love to hear any sort of comment or any sort of feedback from you guys as to what the plan is instead of just silence and more meetings. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, we, we still have a few minutes, uh, Giovanna, we, we could probably take one more. Thank you, Chair Massey. Next person is Andrew Dolberg. If you can please unmute yourself. Hello, this is Andrew. Can you hear me? Yes. I just want to add that I would also love to see a modern skate park built here in San Mateo. I, I am just piggybacking off of everyone else here in agreeance. Um, thank you for your time. Have a good evening. Thank you very much. Um, Giovanna, do we, do we have more or, or what's, what's the situation? At this time, I do not see any additional hands raised, Chair Massey. Okay, well then I will um, close the public comment period and bring us back to uh, tonight's agenda. Um, the next item uh, is, is our new business. Um, and the topic is parks, open spaces, and facility naming poli policy. Sorry. Um, uh, Sheila, I understand that staff has a presentation on this. So thank you, um, Chair Massey. If you just give me a minute, um, I want to share the PowerPoint presentation that I have. Okay, so thank you. Appreciate your patience on this. Um, so um, we're bringing before you an item uh, regarding our current parks and facilities naming policy. Um, and this is really an input session, um, similar to what we did um, last year when we were looking at um, potential changes to our heritage and street tree policy. I'm really looking for commission input tonight so that when staff does go back and draft a policy um, that we have the benefit of input um, from all of you um, before we start that process. So um, I think as you were able to see from the administrative report, our current policy dates from 1979. Um, I think that based upon my read of um, some of the other um, cities policies that it really lacks specificity especially for the threshold around facility naming. I think it does a relatively good job about how parks are named, but I think the, um, the current language is relatively broad um, in terms of um, what should the threshold be um, when there are requests from the public to have a facility named in honor um, of someone in the community. So I think in general, um, as I mentioned, um, the current policy indicates that um, parks are really named after geographical locations um, or significant natural features. And certainly the one that comes to mind is Bay Tree Park. Um, the other one is sort of Sugarloaf Mountain, but most of the other parks with the exception of the three names that you see there are really based around geographic areas. The three exceptions that we have are Martin Luther King Park, um, the Bayside Joinville Park, in which the name of Gordon Joinville, who was a San Mateo police sergeant um, killed in the line of duty, um, his name was added to Bayside Joinville Park because the Joinville pool um, currently resides in Bayside Joinville Park. And then Trina Park, which is a very um, small little league field um, off of Palm and 19th Avenue, 
and it was named for the family that donated the land um, for the Little League field. There were some cleanup name, cleanup modifications that were done to park names in 1980. Um, and again, I mentioned those in the administrative report, there appeared to be some duplications or some similar names. And so the last time that there was any real modifications made to current park names, those occurred in, um, in 1980. The current policy again is very broad and it says facilities within, with, with, within parks may be named after selected individuals in their honor as desired or appropriate. And again, I tried to give some examples of some of the facilities that many of you might be familiar with. The John Lee Dog Park, um, named after former Mayor John Lee. Um, the Jim Chalmers Rotary Grove um, area in Central Park, again, named after a council member and former Mayor Jim Chalmers. The Gary Yates Bocce Court Complex, which is up at Beresford Park, and again, named after um, former council member and Mayor Gary Yates. Uh, the Marion Panaritas Rose Garden, um, which is in Central Park. It is the Rose Garden in Central Park, after, named after someone who was an avid um, horticulturalist and really I think a benefactor of both money and um, commitment to making sure that um, organizations like the Arboretum Society and the San Mateo Garden Center got established. And then there are a series of, of names that really precede my time, as long as I've been here, but things like Fitzgerald Field, um, which is again, was named after a, a major league baseball player, um, San Mateo native, and again, mayor of San Mateo, uh, Channel Oak Field at Beresford Park, which was named after a former fire chief um, and um, local um, youth sports advocate, uh, Doré Field, um, which is out at Harborview Park, um, that was named in honor of John Doré, who donated the land for the park. And then Benoit Field at Mariners Island Park, which was named for Joe Benoit, who was a local citizen who really helped um, establish a local park in that neighborhood. So those are some examples of really facility dedications um, that have been named at least in the recent um, past. Um, as I indicated, the process that, that currently is outlined is, is that requests for um, dedications or for um, name changes come to first the department and that um, the director and the staff would do some background and try to um, find out more information um, to identify whether or not the information that was provided was adequate. Um, at that time, the name um, request would then move on to the Park and Recreation Commission um, for your review. And then ultimately the city council um, would have the final decision um, about name changes. There have been three um, occasions on which the council did not approve name changes. Uh, one was a request for um, a field at Bayside Joinville to rename after Toyonaka. Um, which is our sister city in Japan, the um, city council rejected that one. Um, there was a request many years ago um, to rename what was the former um, San Mateo Municipal Golf Course in honor of uh, golf professional Tom Fry. Um, and that uh, request was rejected. Um, and then it was actually the Park and Recreation Commission that rejected the naming of Central Recreation Center in honor of Bill Schumard, who was a former um, park and recreation director. So it's not an automatic um, that these names are approved. Um, so I just wanted to give you a sense in terms of um, several ones that have not been approved in the past. So really, I think we're looking for just some input to help us on the development of a new policy. I included these questions um, in your administrative report um, and these are really the kind of areas that I'd like to get some feedback on. The first one is really should park and open space lands continue to be named primarily after their geographic location um, or their natural feature? Um, should exceptions be considered? Um, 
should public facilities or amenities within parks continue to be named in honor of selected individual? And if so, what's the threshold of contribution or connection or service uh, by the individual to the facility in question? Um, and then again, in looking at other city policies, some cities only um, consider dedications for those who have died um, and don't consider dedications for those who are still living. So I'll be curious in terms of whether the commission has any input on that. Um, should the existing review and approval process remain or be modified? Again, first come to the department, then go to the Park and Recreation Commission for um, review, and then ultimately on to the city council. Um, shall a facility plaque or some other signage be required to be placed at the site? And if so, who should pay? I think that if you go around to a number of those locations, um, you'll see some great signage um, that is out there that identifies the name. In some of these other locations, there is no um, there is no plaque um, or any signage. And so, um, and, and the reason that I said who should pay is that things, a request like the um, John Lee Dog Park or the Gary Yates Bocce Courts were really ones that I think the council initially um, asked for. And so those I would be, those I would consider to be ones that would be sponsored perhaps by the city. There may be some other ones that maybe were requested by an individual. Um, for example, the Marion Panaritas Rose Garden was requested by the Arboretum Society. And so in that case there, should the Arboretum Society pay for the cost of the plaque um, or should that be something that the city should provide? Um, and then what should occur to the name of facilities decommissioned or demolished? Um, this was not at all addressed um, in the policy. So if a facility goes away, um, does the name go with whatever the new facility is? Um, or how does, that, how does that name continue to be recognized? Um, and then should there be an option for smaller recognitions that may not rise to the level of a facility name change? And again, some cities have established like a wall of fame um, that people can have their names attached to, you know, could there be a bench dedication or a tree dedication? If for some reason, either the commission or the council doesn't feel as though the request to have a facility named after someone um, re reaches that threshold. And then finally, are there any other factors that you want staff to consider? So that's really an outline of the various um, sort of questions um, that uh, we'd like the um, commission to give us some input on. Um, and so with that, I will turn it back to Chair Massey to see if there's any questions um, from commissioners at this point. Um, yeah, I think, I think it, it would be fine to entertain questions just sort of a, across all of the, all of these topics. But I think when we get down to comments, I think it might be useful to take each, uh, each one separately and, and hear from all of the commissioners on, on each one before passing on to the second. So in terms of questions, um, are, are, there any, are there any questions? Yes, have, go ahead, yeah. uh, um, regarding the smaller uh, places that plaques can be benches and that sort of thing, um, we don't we currently have some sort of program for that for benches and like the bricks and that sort of thing. How does that work? So we do um, we do have a, both a memorial bench and a memorial tree um, uh, procedure that we have, and anyone can um, can pay for. Um, a bench to be put in a park. Um, there is a small plaque um, that gets attached to the back of the bench. Um, and there's um, probably um, space for about three um, lines of writing or text, um, depending upon what the, what the person um, wants to say. We also have a memorial tree. Um, we don't encourage people to put plaques at the bottom of trees. 
Um, and so, but we do let them know when a tree has been planted, if they want to come out and have some sort of acknowledgement or ceremony or whatever, um, that's certainly possible as well. The BRIC program that we did for Beresford Playground was really a fundraiser when we built the playground um, at that time. Um, there is going to be a similar program that the um, uh, Fallen Heroes Memorial Committee is thinking about doing uh, to sell bricks um, for the Fallen Heroes Memorial in Central Park. That's just gonna, um, it's just now getting off the ground. Okay, any, any other questions? Yeah, I have a question. Sure, go ahead. Um, do you have any examples of neighboring cities on what they do? What if something is a facility is named and it's demolished or decommissioned? I'm, I'm just, I'm curious about what best practices are here, if you have any examples. So I think it's a really interesting question because when I posed it to my colleagues in other cities, most of them say that their current policy don't address it. <laughs> and so um, I think it's, I'm not sure it's something that has been um, actively discussed in other cities. Um, so I wish I could point you to some other examples. And unfortunately, there just doesn't seem to be any. Uh, any Anything from anybody else? Okay. Well, then why don't we, uh, why don't we move on to, to um, taking up the, each of the topics in order here. Um, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Uh, uh, Chair Massey, before yeah. the commission would do that, I would um, suggest that you open it up for comments from the public um, before um, we start your comments. Good point. Okay, that's fine. Let's, let's do that. Um, Giovanna, we could um, open public comment on this topic. Thank you, Chair Massey. We do have one hand raised from Drew. Drew, if you could unmute yourself, please. Good evening. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, informative as almost always here. So I certainly have some thoughts on all these little bullets, but I only have a few minutes to talk. So there's one, one or two other items that I kind of this general naming thing brings up that I think it's an could be an important thing to do as kind of part of this is, especially as I kind of review like where some of the names came from like part of me says a review kind of a review going back in history of San Mateo and I don't mean spending a month on it but in the sense that were there people missed were there like some of these people are council members I hear a bunch of council members well what about were there citizens who did stuff back in the 1950s or the 1920s were there uh, certain uh, ethnic groups that just wouldn't have been considered for these kind of things because of, you know, the way society was. And I don't view this as we have to get this perfect max of like 1% of this population, 10% of this. It's more if they're, you know, somewhat if there's some more obvious examples and stuff. And this is an opportunity to say, here are some people that in hindsight probably should have been recognized and weren't, and when there's some opportunities coming forward, it might make sense to recognize them um, and stuff. And again, I'm not looking for a quota necessarily, and maybe the library has like a section on San Mateo history and some stuff. So not looking to make a huge project about this, but just, it's kind of a question. I wonder about who's been missed over the hundred years of San Mateo history. Um, you know, there's people that just, do the right thing or are heavily involved, but you know they didn't make a big name for themselves. So that's kind of one, that was my main thing. And then I think the other was, I, I very much appreciate in general, the geographic kind of names to the overall park. And then within the park, there may be a facility within the park that has a particular name. I, I like, I think that's a actually a really great thing of San Mateo. Um, so I would like continue that forward. And then uh, with that said, to some degree, though, if some billionaire wanted to come in and give us like $50 million for the Central Park to make a change, I certainly would have a lot more openness to possibly doing that. Uh, but it would be significant. And 
like, but we would just be pretty blunt about it. Like, hey, they're making a huge donation and that's why we're making an exception to the rule or something. But, uh, but it's just kind of explicit about that. Is it a money donation? Is it an effort donation? Like someone's just put a lot of time in, in whatever it is versus like the memorial donation or memorial kind of thing with Martin Luther King Park and stuff. But, uh, but in general, I like the site thing overall, like where it's at is the first thing and then a bunch of names below it. So uh, again, thank you for the time to speak. Thank you very much for your comments. Um, would staff have any any uh, comment on the first uh, point that Drew raised about the possibility of of doing this research that he he spoke of? So maybe we'll first ask whether or not there's any other members of the public um, who have any comments, and then maybe staff can address those. Everything at once. Total. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Giovanna, do we have anyone else? There are no other members of the public at this time, Chair Massey. Okay. Um. Uh, so I I um, I think the the um, the uh, pattern for facility naming, um, particularly for amenities, has really been at the request of someone or by the city council. It has not been something that has been holistically looked at in terms of saying, are there particular individuals um, that have been overlooked? Um, if that's something that the commission would be interested in having us take a look at, um, we certainly could. Um, but I think for the most part, the names, facility names that you have seen are really ones that have been um, requested by someone or initiated um, with the lead of the city council. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, do we have any, so we have, we have no other members of the public wanting to comment? Not at this time, Chair Massey. Okay, then I will close the public comment period and bring this back to the commission um, and, to, and have us start with the, the first question that we've been asked at, about, um, naming policy for park and open space lands. Um, Commissioner Wallach, could we start with you? Yes. Okay, um, so I, I like the geographic naming. I think it really kind of creates a sense of um, everyone owns these parks, that it doesn't have an individual name on it. Um, and I, I think it also really helps avoid confusion um, when it's just named after its location. I think it, it's just easier. So I, um, I'm kind of a little, I mean, I, I, I understand the point Drew's making. Um, I, and I'm certainly not against large donations for things, but I think maybe we should kind of draw the line. Um, that's what I'm thinking currently, draw the line at the actual park itself being called after someone who makes a large donation. Um, I think maybe an exception like with Trinta where someone donates the actual land that the park is gonna be on, that might be a, a consideration for an exception. Um, but I think we have plenty of things to name and, you know, as the facilities get rebuilt, I think there are large things that we can rename or name um, based on donations. So I, that's sort of my thoughts at the moment on that one. Okay, Commissioner Field. Um, I think I'm in agreement with Commissioner Walnick. Um, I agree that we should stick to geographic location or natural features, um, both for ease of knowing the park, you know, where it is, um, but also it's a lot of them people know, you know, they know Central Park. And if you called it something else, um, perhaps it would be confusing. Um, we'd also have to make new maps. Um, but I just think generally it's nice to keep the name associated with the neighborhood, with the, with the geography where it's located. Um, I do think there's room for 
things within a park to be named, trees, benches, um, you know, as appropriate, maybe a flagpole or a playground. Um, but I think the overall park and open space itself should be um, named for its location. Thank you, Commissioner Hall. I agree with both Commissioner Fields and Commissioner Wolnick. Um, are we are we not addressing the other questions at the moment? Well, I, 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 in in the interests of keeping this somewhat organized, I was going to have us go through one at a time. Okay, then then I I agree thus far. I'm I'm good. Okay, well, I'll make it unanimous. Um, I think that the current policy of, of maintaining, of naming park and open space lands primarily after geographic location, et cetera, um, should be continued. And really, I think the only exception that we might want to consider is if we had, for example, we want to develop Central Park and somebody came along and said, I'm willing to pay for the whole thing. Okay, the council might want to consider that. And, and I, uh, I understand we're um, adopting a policy here and, and that this policy would go on from us through the, through the department to the council and would be adopted by the council. But the council, as I understand it, would always retain the ability to make exceptions to the policy if something truly exceptional came along. And I, I think we could leave the, the possibility of exceptions there. And, and, and that is that that power rests with the council. And if something is so extraordinary that uh, they, they would want to consider going outside the policy, that's up to their discretion. At least that, that's the way I see it. If anyone strongly disagrees with me on this, please speak up. I don't disagree. I do, I do think um, there's value in considering um, encouraging donated land since that is really in short supply. Um, and having an right. exception, if someone donates the land, they potentially get their name on it. Um, seems to me something that might be worth considering as a written exception. Um, but that's the only, you know, I agree with you that the commission or this, the council can always make an exception to their own policy. Uh, any, any other thoughts on this? I'm, I'm inclined to agree about those who donate land because you're right, that's, that's, that's a special thing. I agree. Okay, um, let's move on to the next one then. Um, and now we're down to the uh, public facilities or amenities within parks, uh, which uh, are in, in, in some cases and would, and would continue to be uh, eligible for naming uh, for selected individuals. Um, what, uh, How does everybody feel about that? Um, oh, if I can just add, a, if I can just add a comment before you all get started, I think what we're um, what we're not looking for is some qualitative or quantitative saying somebody has to have done X number of donations or X number of hours or X number of something. I think what we're really trying to do is really do a more um, qualitative type of identifying the things that would be important for this commission and for the council to consider when a request for naming comes before you. Um, again, if you look at the current policy, I think it says, you know, that uh, amenities can be named in honor of someone as desired. That doesn't give us much direction. <laughs> um, whereas if you were to say that, and again, some other cities have said that the kinds of things that should be looked at are, you know, um, volunteer contributions or some monetary contributions or something that would say this facility and this request for renaming have some sort of connection with each other. And I think that's what we're really trying to get at 
rather than trying to quantify it by a dollar amount or uh, you know how had to have contributed so many hours of service that's not what we're trying to get to okay thank you thank you very much for that that clarification um so should we go the other way commissioner holm um i actually am fine with it being vague i think it's it's fine to let it be for various things i think partly the, the fact that you have a process where it gets taken to staff and then staff takes it to the commission the commission then gives their feedback and then it would ultimately go to council is is enough of a sort of a deliberative process that you're not going to get like i can't you know go recommend that you name it after my favorite pet or whatever um it just wouldn't wouldn't fly but i think i could think of uh either outstanding contributions that maybe members of the public have made or or maybe um you know, you could have a case where where someone acted heroically in one instance, and and you wanted to name it in that case, or or where someone maybe um, died tragically, and, and and you want to name something in that in their honor in that fashion. So um, I'm fine with it being open, um, and I also don't have any issue with recognition being considered for individuals if they're alive or if they've they've passed away. Um, I think in the in the case of Recognition for service, that's often something you would want to do while someone's alive, if they've, you know, retired or they're, um, they've committed a long, a long, uh, a considerable amount of service. Um, I do think in the examples you shared, it's kind of boring that several of the things are named after um, city, city council members. Um, so I think we need some more variety. Um, but, but apart from that, I mean, that's probably because of the territory, because that's the world that the people that understand this and, and know to to give recognition of those nature but but i would like to see some more variety in the in the naming of 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 things um but yeah i think i think anything's open okay um <clears throat> commissioner wolnick uh sure um so i i agree Let's see, with Commissioner Holm on the uh, living or dead, I, I agree, especially with the service, that it's good to do it while, while folks are still alive. Um, I really want to stress that, the, that there be some connection to park or recreation within the city. I think there's lots of other things we can name that the city council could name after someone who did great things for the city, but not related to parks. Um, so I think that that's a good threshold to have um, for this particular policy. Uh, obviously, the city council can make an exception or disagree with that, but um, that to me seems seems really significant. Um, trying to decide if some of these comments are on this one or not. Um, and I really did like the kind of the historical naming of um, that there not just be a connection to parks in general, but that there be a connection to a specific facility. Sometimes that's obviously not going to work out. Um, maybe someone did something, you know, or spent their lifetime fighting for all parks or recreation or whatever it is. But um, but it is nice to see that connection to a particular facility, like a garden. Um, maybe not so much with a building, but you know, with the rose garden and the the fields, um, having you know someone who's volunteered a lot of time with youth sports or something like that um, seems like a good way to go. Uh, on the the building front, um, I think um, sort of the same thing, but I'm more inclined to say that that's really where we want to put the money. You know, um, we're gonna have a big facilities maintenance plan or not maintenance, but rebuilding plan, you know, hopefully coming soon. And um, we're going to need money to do that. And so I think, you know, naming buildings, naming pools after people that give large donations um, is, is going to be necessary. I would, um, it wasn't really brought up here, but I would really strongly say that we do not name anything after corporations um, or businesses, but that it really be people. Um, 
as those change and go. And I don't know, it's just a group of people anyway. So it seems like individuals should be the way to go on that one. Um, I think that one's on the next one. Okay, I think that's it for this one. Thanks. Okay, Commissioner Fields. Okay, um, I generally agree with the framework that my previous two commissioners have kind of set out, like looking for significant contribution, which doesn't necessarily mean significant financial contribution, although it could, um, but really someone who's an impactful individual in the city of San Mateo. Um, and impact can be measured in a variety of ways, someone who's really you know, a model citizen, someone who's a, a community leader. Um, you know, there's different kind of words that I think come to mind, but really, you know, an exceptional person. Um, I actually, I disagree with my with my commissioners on the issue of should a, should a person be alive and there should be uh, something named after them. Um, I actually feel quite strongly about this. I really think you can't know someone's legacy until unfortunately they've left this world. And um, there's been issues, I think, as close as in San Francisco, I think you all know that there's a Diane Feinstein Elementary School that uh, the school board there has, has brought up several times to possibly rename. Personally, I disagree with that, but um, you know, as people's legacies are still you know, being crafted, um, it may come to pass that a name is regretted. Um, of course, that would be a really unfortunate situation to be in, but that is a, a challenge of naming things after someone who is alive. They still have living to be doing. Um, and of course, we would hope that they continue to do great living, but there's no guarantee. Um, so I personally would really caution against naming anything after someone who's still alive, um, with the exception that perhaps if someone was donating and they wanted it to be named after like their family, you know, the Fields family pool or something, maybe, maybe that would be an exception, but I think that's kind of it. Um, my family is not donating for a pool, just for the record, um, but that, just an example. Um, but yeah, I really, really what I'm looking for is someone who's impactful. Um, that's the word I'm, I'm thinking about, um, someone who's really a model for what, what we would want to hold up in San Mateo. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you all very much. Um, I'm, I'm generally in agreement with the comments that have been made. Um, I think I'm, I'm more relaxed in terms of the need for the, uh, the person's contribution, be it financial or, or service. And I, and I think you know, honoring service really should um, should be the, the, the focus of this. And, um, obviously we would, we would like people to make major donations to help us build things, et cetera. But um, I think service should be the focus of this. But I, in terms of uh, the sorts of connections that, that might be found for two specific facilities, et cetera, I think if someone has, um, made a substantial, extraordinary contribution to the city of San Mateo, I think that um, we should be, um, that, that, that kind of person should be uh, con considered a, a, a candidate uh, for a, a naming. Um, I'm also, I, I'm, I'm on the, I'm a little on the fence about the issue of living or versus deceased. I, I think Commissioner Fields has a good point on that. Um, but I think we need, and, and I'm not sure how this would be drafted, but I think, I think we need to leave the door open to people whose contributions to our city are, are so outstanding that, um, we feel they should be honored. And, and I wouldn't want a policy to be written so narrowly that that was just entirely foreclosed. Uh, the one question that I was, did not appear here, but I'm, in, I'm indebted to Commissioner Wolnick for this one is, are we going to limit the naming to individuals? 
as opposed to corporations or names of businesses or or what have you. Um, I'm uh, I, I lean heavily in that direction. Uh, businesses can be a source of funds. Uh, it's unlikely, I suspect, that a business as such is going to make such contributions to the city that we want to name a facility after the business. But uh, I, I don't know that we want to end up with a whole series of, of city facilities named after one or another uh, corporate entity. Uh, but I'd be interested in, in uh, the views of the other two of you who haven't spoken on this point um, about that, because I think the policy should say something about it one way or the other. So I, I wanna respond to that because I think the scenario that came to mind, which I had meant to say, and I apologize for not saying this earlier, is that I could imagine a developer as an amenity giving land for a park or developing a park as a part of a development. And I, I would want that park to then just be named, you know, the 8th Street Park or something, not, you know, name of developer park. If I could um, just interject here only Please. because I, I've done this for eight years on the Planning Commission, as a general proposition, where you have a development that is going to include a park that is wrapped into a, a development agreement and that becomes an obligation on the part of the developer. And I, I don't know that anybody's considered that uh, any obligation to name the park after the developer went along with it. it was, it's part of the package um, that is ultimately approved by the council uh, for the development to be constructed. Yeah, I just, I didn't want to plant an idea that, you know, we would now get, you know, parks named after developers or parks named after um, shopping center, to, you know, designers or who knows. Yeah, I, I, at least for my part, total agreement. Total Great. Agreement. Uh, Commissioner Holm, what, what are your thoughts? Uh, I have less issues with it. Um, you know, I, I remember when Candlestick Park became, I think the first rename was Precom Park or, mm -hmm. or it was- That was it. Um, and I remember like how that just felt so wrong. Um, but then at the time, you know, people were talking about uh, how other things had been named after corporations. And it just it just felt wrong because a, a tech company seemed so new and not legacy. Um, and and it's sort of funny because you have like in in major league sports you have things that are named after corporations all the time so they make a lot of money. Um, but I think of uh, the Giants Park, which is you know Pac Bell, AT and T. Well, you know I I I know. Even, I like I call it the wrong name every time I call it because they change all the time. Um, but on the other hand, um, you know, Wrigley Field is named after a corporation. Um, so, you know, I think it's just something that over time that that changes. And, and so I have less concerns or issues with it. Um, I mean, I'm generally pretty anti-corporation, but uh, but I also think if, if they're gonna donate a significant amount of money, and we're not talking about a park, we've all said that we want the parks to be named after um, the, the, the landmarks or the, the location or the neighborhood or, or significant things. So we're talking about a building and if it's the, the Tesla building or the you know, Cisco building, whatever, whatever they wanna be, I don't have an issue with it. Okay, and any other thoughts on this topic before we leave it? Okay, well then why don't we move on to uh, the existing review and approval process. Does that seem satisfactory or do people have ideas for modifications? Commissioner Field, you get to go first this time. I think the way it stands right now is fine. Okay. 
Um, Commissioner Holm? I'm fine with it the way it is. Commissioner Wolnick? Me too, fine with it. Okay. Um, I am too, but there's there is an aspect that I wanted just to 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 bring up in this context, and, and it really goes back to uh, to Drew's uh, public comment earlier on, uh, and that is uh, the existing review and approval process um, really implies that either the city council or one or more interested members of the public. Are, are going to propose names of people to be honored through their names being attached to a particular facility. Um, is, should there be any uh, effort or, or responsibility on the part of the city to seek out people who might, um, be worthy of the honor of having their name appear on a building? Or is, this, is, the, is that aspect of the current review and approval process the way this should go? And that is if, if the council wants to, do, to honor somebody, that's always their prerogative. If interested members of the public want to propose someone uh, that maybe that's, that's the, the source, that's where that's where the, these um, proposals should come from. Any thoughts on that? Anybody? Yeah, I, I mean, I think in, in general, a, a historic review would be great. I think it's a little bit unrealistic um, for staff time. I mean, maybe when there's like one specific thing that we're looking for a name, the city council can say, you know, we're looking for someone, can you go back to, through history and see if there's someone we can pull out. Um, but it does, I mean, I really, I, I like the idea of making sure we've included, but I, I think in practicality, it's it's gonna be really challenging um, for, for staff to do that. Anybody else? I think, I think it's fraught with challenges. And anyone staff picks, there's gonna be someone they miss. And so I think, I think the current method is fine. And if someone from the public wants to uh, recognize someone from history that has not been uh, recognized, then they can bring it forward and um, that's fine. But I think as soon as we put it on staff as a responsibility to come up with them, then you're opening up a whole different challenge. Commissioner Fields? Uh, you need to unmute. I generally agree. I think that it's a nice idea if there were time or if there were, say, you know, a citizens group, uh, you know, the historical society had some, some recommendations, that sort of thing. Um, I'd be happy to entertain it. But, um, you know, I think we should, moving forward, be, you know, be aware of people who have had significant contributions to the city of San Mateo. Um, but I don't, I just, I, I can't imagine staff having the time to do the research that I think this would require. Um, but I think it's a nice idea. Well, I, I'm, I'm in agreement with where, where, I, where I think we're, we're all coming out and that is the answer to that question is no. Um, that, that that the city should should not take on the obligation to sort of come up with names. Uh, my own feeling is that the the in, the primary source of this should be um, interested members of the public, uh, with the council always having the the prerogative to um, propose names. Um, but I did I did think that staff would benefit from some direct input on that point. Um, facility plaques uh, or other signage, and uh, if we're going to have them, who's going to pay for them? Thoughts on that one? Anybody? 
Yeah, I mean, I think there should be a fee associated with the plaque, but that the city should administer it, frankly, so there's uniformity of the plaque. Um, but I would also say related to the plaque is I think it's useful to have a little bit of context about what was happening. Like, you know, maybe it's the name and then a lot, you know, assuming it's a memorial plaque, so like a name, you know, the year they were born, the year that they passed away, and maybe like a sentence, you know, um, or just a title, something to give it a little bit of context. So we know like, ah, this, you know, this tree is in memorial of, you know, a little league coach that was so great or something. I mean, I just think it it's nice as a, an experience in the park to be able to walk by a plaque and not just see a name, but to know a little bit about sort of why. <laughs> But I think the city should administer it for the sake of uniformity. But I, I do think, especially if it's if the nomination is coming from a group, um, like with the with the Rose Garden example, I think the group should be asked to contribute some amount of money. Maybe it's hundred dollars. Maybe it's two hundred dollars. I think Sheila can probably give us some better context about what would an appropriate fee be. Um, but I think a fee paid to the city to support the creation of that plaque would be appropriate. Okay. Um, Commissioner Hall? I, I generally agree, but I, I think we need to distinguish, um, you know, in the case of a tree that's often, or a bench, that's usually a name. It's not something where you add context. But if you're naming a, a garden, a rose garden, then maybe you would have a plaque that, that is more substantial. Or if you're naming a building, you would maybe say, this is in honor of such and such person. Um, and you can even have the, the etching of the purchase of person's portrait in a case or something like that. So I think I think the the uniformness or the standard will change depending on what type of plaque or building or you know canvas opportunities there are. Um, so I think I think yes, it should be administered by the department, but that it's not sort of a one size fits all. Um, I also think that um, maybe instead of sort of saying who should pay, maybe that just the only the statement should say that any dedication is not necessarily the financial responsibility of the Parks and Rec Department. So that there is a negotiation that, um, but but you know you don't get someone who says you know I want a park named after my dead relative and gets it approved and then expects something from the park uh, you know by having it in the policy maybe that that it it is not you know a, a naming of it or an agreement is not necessarily a, a financial obligation to the park that maybe you know gives the director some ability to have a discussion because i definitely think it's different depending on the context and depending on the need and um you know like like the rose garden example yeah that makes sense that the Arboretum Society would would fundraise and raise the money, and they would probably be willing, gladly willing to, and do that because they're um, expressing recognition and appreciation for that member that contributed so much over the years. Um, but if I was a um, regular person, I may say, "Hey, I want. I think you know, we should have the uh, this Martin Luther King Building or whatever it is that, um, and and maybe maybe I don't want to pay for it. Well, then. Sure, we can name it after that, and maybe um, you know it's just on the file. And maybe when you remodel the building, you add that to it, or maybe you don't, or whatnot. But and then you have another case where council brings something forward and says we want to name it after uh, some fallen hero or some year, you know, long contributing member of staff or whatever. And and the council can say we and we think we should pay for it, and that's sort of a council decision on it. So I think you have different cases and I think that just sort of giving the department some coverage to say that just the approval of a naming will not make will not guarantee payment I think is, is probably maybe the way to go. Commissioner Walnick. Yeah I, I agree I think there's so much gray area here um, I'm uh, I think I, I agree all in, in substance with what Commissioner Holm was saying. I'm trying to come up with a succinct way of, of doing that, but I, 
um, I don't have it. Um, but yeah, I think there's so many different ways um, this could come to the council to approve that I think it really should be just ultimately up to the council um, whether the city pays for it or not. Uh, yeah, I, sorry, I don't have anything more specific on that. <laughs> No, that no, that's that's fine. Thank you. Um, well, I, I actually agree with Commissioner Wolnick on, on the payment part of this. I think that um, that should be a decision of the council. Uh, my own my own personal leaning on this is towards the city paying, um, and I, I think because I think there should be, if we are going to name a facility after somebody, I think there should be a facility plaque so that the me me members of the public who visit the building or the facility have some way of finding out who was this person. Um, it, it always bugs me that when you're driving around the Bay Area that there are freeway overpasses that are named for people. And if you make the same freeway trip frequently, you go over the same overpass and you see the same name. And every time you look at it, you say, who was that person? Why did that, there was this freeway overpass name for this person. And I think that the same sort of curiosity arises if you're going, walking into a park and rec facility and it's the, you know, the, 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 the Jane Rowe, uh, recreation facility. Well, who is Jane Rowe? Why? Why was you know? Why was this facility named after her? And so I think we do it. Should we should have a facility plaque? I think it should go with the naming of a building or a facility for somebody. And I don't think that uh, the the addition of a plaque should be dependent on a third party being willing to pay for it. Um, you know, that said, I think there are the situations that, that the other three of you have, have brought up that are, you're, you're absolutely right on, that there are situations where it is reasonable to ask for a, an association like, like the Arboretum Society in, in the uh, example of the, the Rose Garden. Um, to put up a plaque and, and where the council would say, okay, we trust a group like that to put up an appropriate plaque. Um, but I think the city needs to control this and controlling and paying are probably largely, but not entirely gonna end up going together. So that, those are just my thoughts on this. Any <laughs> other? I think you're supposed to stop in the fast lane and jump out and look at the column. And see uh -huh. if there's anything. I'll, I'll, it might I'll be there. Keep, I'll make, keep that in mind. Make sure you cross a couple lanes of traffic too while you're doing that. Yeah, exactly. Um, I wanted to uh, add on, I, I think there is, um, if someone is donating money and gets their name on something, that to me seems like a no brainer that they should have to pay for the plaque, but I'm not really sure how to write, how to get that in. But it seems like if, if the, the reasoning is service, um, then the city would probably wanna take that on. And I definitely agree with Commissioner Massey on, and um, I think Commissioner Fields also mentioned this, like an explanation of why something is named after them, I think makes it, um, I mean, we named it for a reason, right? We want people to know why it's named after whoever it is. Okay, um, what happens if a facility is decommissioned or abolished and that facility was named for somebody? What do we do? Anybody? I have thoughts on this one too. <laughs> I, I think maybe that you, in your naming, you maybe say that, um, you know, the naming will not necessarily last beyond X years, like 10 years or something to that effect. And, um, and that, allows that if a building is decommissioned or demolished, then you don't necessarily have to carry that name forward. But, um, you know, sometimes like, like you think about Central Park, there's, um, there's the, the pavilion 
in the middle of the park that I think in the master plan isn't going to be there anymore. And so if that had a name on it right now, you know, would you, would you say, oh, well, this building's been named, so now we have to keep this building? No, you wouldn't. You would still remove the building. And so I think if it's had some period of time in memoriam um, that, you know, and, and the um, facility the commissioner is demolished, then, then that's what happens. Um, and I think, um, you know, similarly um, to the comments, maybe this is for other factors to be considered, um, but, um, you know, the comments from Commissioner Fields earlier about it only being for deceased people because, you know, someone's not done living and they could do something controversial. Um, so I'm, I, I work in Palo Alto where we've renamed two schools because the school was named after somebody for 50 years and then um, the acts of the person historically was viewed under a different lens and we renamed it. So it was named after a dead person, um, but then we determined the person or the person's father was a member of eugenics because we weren't actually sure uh, one of our schools was was named uh, and there was two notable people the father and son were both notable in the community and so there was a uh, uncertainty over who the person which which person it was actually named over which term but, it was but yeah. you know there's still a term in freeway yeah speaking of freeways <laughs> chair massey so uh, uh -huh. so you know but but the father was a, was a strong proponent of the eugenics movement and there's a there's a whole discussion of well was that a period of the times or is that, you know, wrong under a lens of today versus a lens at the time and all of that. And so I think um, society changes and, and maybe, maybe things do warrant being renamed under different um, conditions and lenses and, and whatnot. And so from that standpoint, I think you should allow that a, a name could be changed if so deemed. And then by, by the corollary of that, I, that's why I think having it, you go ahead and have it named after someone living, um, because if they later do something that society deems is uh, unsavory or um, unworthy of that name, um, then you change it. And I mean, if you say, say you had uh, some rich person that donated a building and you had the, the Harvey Weinstein building, and then, um, you know, you have all of the the scandals that come out and the information that comes out and then you go, well, wait a minute, okay, um, let's rename it. So I think that if you have a, a time period that says this will be um, for X number of years, that's fine. And, and, and similarly, you know, we've had this discussion in the past in relation to naming of trees, I think, um, where we've done either, we, I think, I can't remember what park we talked about, maybe the Central Park, we talked about it. Um, but we were talking about, well, you know, if a, if a tree has been named because, because one of the fundraising efforts was to sell trees for $500 each or whatever it was, and, and we have the, the Massey tree and the field tree and the walnut tree. And, and, and so, you know, a storm takes a tree out, are you obligated to put it back? Or, or you redesign the park and you need to move some trees, are you obligated to put it back? And I think at the time, our consensus was, no, if it's if it's lived a life of some period of time, then you know it has served that that life. And so similarly, I think if you you just sort of say that like any name naming activity has a has a guarantee of ten years or twenty years or some some reasonable longevity to it, and, and the reality is it's probably going to be that way forever. Um, but if it needs to change, it needs to change. Okay. Um, other any other thoughts? Either one. Yeah, I think it would make sense to include language that says, in the event that a building or you know facility is decommissioned or demolished, the city reserves the right to end the name. Um, and I also think we can include language like, if appropriate, 
we'll explore the option of continuing the name, right? Like, the, I, I mean, for example, like if we redesigned entirely, I don't think that this is happening anytime soon, but if we redesigned entirely um, MLK Park, we might keep the name, for example. So I, I can imagine if someone was really incredible that we would want to keep the name, but we can, we can include language that says we might not. Um, I think the flexibility is reasonable. Um, because Commissioner Holm brought it up, I, I'm going to say I really feel strongly about not naming things after living people. Um, I, I hear your term in example. I, there was another, there were two, middle, your two of your three middle schools in Palo Alto were renamed. And it was really controversial and really challenging, even with not living people. And I think when you have living people, you end up pulling in, if you're in a situation where you, it's suggested that you rename, or it may be appropriate for you to rename, it ends up becoming really controversial and challenging. And this is really, in, the intention of all of this is to honor someone doing something nice for the community. Um, and I just think it's best to be avoided. I hear what my other commissioners are saying, and maybe I'm gonna be outvoted on this, but I feel very strongly that we should not be naming anything after anyone who's alive. Okay, Commissioner Wallen. Sure. Um, I think I agree that um, when a facility is decommissioned or demolished, it should just be the name goes away. The city can choose to keep the name there or move the name to something else if really significant. I think that's always an option. Um, I. I um, I agree with the sentiment, but I don't think the policy really needs to say that we have the option to keep the name because I think that's just implied. Um, I think Commissioner Holmes' idea of a, of a kind of a term, um, it, it's, it's simple. It'd be simple to execute, I think, um, to kind of leave the the option to rename after a period of time. I, can, I think it really kind of depends on what it is. Um, a building is a little bit different than um, a grove that may be moved at a later time or something. I, I, I don't know. So there might be some, some thought to different, for lack of a better way to say it, like different classes of facilities that are named for time, um, for time purposes. And with that also, perhaps um, that also might be considered for the living versus deceased question um, that maybe a smaller facility, it's okay to name after a living person. I, I, I'm just throwing out ideas here. I don't strongly, um, I don't have a strong opinion one way or the other on the living or deceased, but maybe that's something to consider is different facilities can have a different policy on that. Um, because I do, I do see Commissioner Field's point about it gets sticky if the person's alive and has, um, is still wielding power and the name we wanna get rid of the name, it does become challenging. So, but it's probably more challenging if it were a building than if it were a, uh, a small rose garden or a corner of a park or something like that. I think I touched on all the points there. Um, uh, also a thought, I don't know how I feel about it, but I'm just gonna throw out the idea um, that maybe there's, um, the term can be, a, a, and this is more on the donation side, not on the service side, but on the donation side that maybe there's a um, level of donation associated with a term that something is, is named after someone. Um, the higher, obviously the higher the donation, the longer you get your name on whatever it is. Okay, that's it for me. Thank you. Um, I, I'm, um, I think, all of you have expressed um, really good and thoughtful ideas around all this. I personally like Commissioner Field's formulation that, that as a general matter, 
uh, if the facility is decommissioned or demolished, that the name would go with it, uh, but that the council always retains the ability to make an exception to that and continue the name. And, and uh, beyond that, I, I don't have any anything to add that hasn't already been well expressed by everybody else. Uh, smaller recognitions, do we want? I don't, um, Sheila, I don't think the policy addresses that directly at present, as I recall. No, it doesn't. And I think what, what this was intended to do is that we, we, we all wait, we, we currently have, again, I mentioned we currently have the opportunity for people to buy a bench or buy a tree. I think what we were trying to get to on this is that if a request say came forward to the commission and you all didn't feel as though it rose to the level of whatever those thresholds might be to rename a facility, would you then say, um, okay, the city will then put a plaque on a bench rather than saying, so it was really sort of an alternative if in fact a request came forward that you or the city council didn't feel quite met the threshold. Um, I think that's what we were trying to get at wow. by, by opting this question. Okay. Well, thoughts on that one? Anybody? I think that makes sense to have an alternate. Um, I do remember we spoke about tree dedication previously and we had a debate about um, plaques versus no plaques and I know it's the current kind of policy not to put plaques on the trees and I think we talked about a map of some sort that people can go find the trees can you maybe refresh our memory on that one a little bit so I think that um, it is that we don't currently have a practice where we're putting plaques at the bottom of trees um, to say this tree is in dedicated in memory of so and so um, but that for the people who are donating or paying for the tree that we would give them a map that would say, here's a location. And then at some point, if they wanted to come out and do some sort of ceremony that they knew exactly where that tree would be located. Okay. Okay, I'm, I'm, that's all for me on this one. Okay. Um, I don't know, Commissioner Hall. I'm fine with it. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Fields? I think that's fine. I'm, I'm good with the conversation is right now. Okay, a a as am I. Um, anything else that anybody uh, wants to throw into the pot here in terms of other, other factors to be considered? I don't think I have any other comments. Okay. I just wanted to say, I really want this to be considered a great honor to have something named after someone, you know, that if, if someone's, you know, father or brother or something is, you know, having, having something named after them, I want them to feel a sense of pride that, you know, they can feel excited that this is be, that this is happening. And so I wanted to, I wanted to remain special. So, you know, if we do, um, you know, have an option for significant donations to the city. I don't want it to become something where there's, it gets kind of diluted. I, I want it to remain special is what I'm trying to get at. Okay. Commissioner Walnut? Yeah, I, I agree. I don't think we want to be walking through the park and having, you know, just names on everything tacked up. Um, but I think, uh, so some, somewhere in the policy sort of, um, some vague language about, you know, fits the, the ambiance of the park or, you know, the, the general scheme of that park, uh, I think gives some flexibility on that. But I, I do agree that it, it should be, it should remain special. I think that was well put. Well, I, I, I agree with those sentiments. And I, I do think the policy needs to state very clearly that uh, a person will not be considered uh, for naming of a, of a facility 
um, unless that person has, has done something significant and substantial for the city, be it service or perhaps financial contribution. But um, that naming a, facilities are not going to be named for people just because uh, one or more members of the public uh, would like to see a particular person honored. Uh, there has to be a connection to contribution to the city. And I think the policy has to be very firm and very clear on that point. So uh, I have one more, one more yeah, comment. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so sort of a question. Sheila, you've been with the Parks Department how many years? Too many. <laughs> Have you, is 40, there anyone that's 45? Is there anyone that's worked in the city more years than you've done? Um, in the city or in the Parks and Recreation Department? In the city. Um, I suspect that there may be. How about in the Parks Department? You hold the record? Uh, I might, but I'd have to do, <laughs> have to do some research on that. So I just, I, I, I feel equally as adamant in the other directions as Commissioner Fields about uh, living versus uh, deceased naming because I would, if, if we were five or 10 or however many years after Sheila retires and someone proposed a uh, naming of a facility of the Kansi and such and such, I would wholeheartedly support it uh, because you know I think that there are cases where you will have someone who is um, still vibrant and you would want to honor them and pay recognition for their contributions. And I have, I have no issues with that. So I just wanted to sort of throw that out there. Agreed. Anything, anything else before we wrap this up? So first off, I really appreciate, I know these are um, difficult conversations because everybody has a different perspective on it. I do think that I heard some consistent themes throughout. Um, you know, staff will go back and try to take an, an opportunity to draft a policy that will come back um, in, in a couple of months. Um, it may not be perfect, but we'll look to the commission to try to tweak it at that time. So um, thank you very much. This has been very, very helpful. Um, for us to move forward. Well, and I would just like to thank my fellow commissioners for a very uh, thoughtful and, uh, sub and substantive discussion of, of this um, and it conducted in a spirit of, of cooperation and, and respect for one another's ideas. Uh, I, I think we have a great commission going and I wanna thank you all for making that possible. Uh, with that, I think we move on to announcements and so forth. Uh, do you have anything for us, Sheila? Um, I just wanted to um, announce in case you haven't driven by Central Park lately, our ice rink, our seasonal ice rink is gonna be back this year um, and they've started construction on it. Um, the tentative opening date is November 13th. Um, so, and, and uh, they'll be there for about two months um, as they typically are. So um, I hope the community is gonna look forward to having their seasonal ice rink back um, at Central Park. And then secondly, we do have our winter wonderland coming up um, at Central Park on December 4th. Um, it's um, at, series of outdoor activities um, in Central Park. Uh, we did it not last year, but we did it the previous three years where we had some carriage rides and some games. Um, because we are not doing our annual holiday festival of dance at the um, San Mateo High School gym, uh, we just didn't feel comfortable putting 1200 people in a gym right now. And so we actually will be doing some of the classes we'll actually be doing um, their presentations on the outside stage, the outdoor stage of Central, um, assuming the weather stays. So 
we're going to be incorporating some of those dance classes that would typically um, do a um, um, a presentation at the holiday festival of dance and include that in winter wonderland uh, is coming up on december 4th um anything from the commission i have a question um i'm not sure exactly what it is but uh, it's regarding the skateboarding. Um, so I, I, I don't think our commission has ever had what they're suggesting a listening session. I mean, that's not typically what we do. Um, but I'm, I'm, I guess, I, I guess I'm wondering what direction that could go because they're, I mean, I, I don't know. Have you been continuing to meet with them? Um, so I know that um, there has also been a discussion that our city manager has had with um, Ryan um, about it. Um, I think that uh, we certainly want to make sure that when we get to the point of prioritizing how to spend the $400,000 for improvements that the skate community will absolutely be involved in that. I don't, there's no question in terms of that. that um, CIP project is not budgeted with even any money until next year. Right. Um, so I think that there, there will absolutely be an opportunity to um, have that discussion with them at the time. If there is interest as part of a longer term capital improvement program in which the commission wants to consider trying to number one, identify a site and secondly, appropriate um, or consider appropriating money for a brand new skate park, then I think that discussion really needs to be had relative to all the other unmet recreational needs in San Mateo. Um, and I know that this particular um, constituency has been very vocal about the need. Um, as I've indicated in several conversations that I've had with Ryan, um, the number one request for facilities that we get bar none is for pickleball courts in San Mateo. Um, and so I think that's really the role of the commission to then look at all those kinds of requests and say, where do we wanna prioritize our land and where do we wanna prioritize our money? And I think that's part of a larger capital improvement discussion. Yeah, and how does that kind of come up before us? I mean, I, we do the capital improvement plan, but I, I don't know that I've really seen that sort of discussion. Um, before us before. So I think it'll probably, and we generally bring that, the proposed capital improvement program ideas to the commission generally in January or February. Um, I think what may be helpful for the commission this year is that we would probably also bring to you a list of some of the um, requests that we have had for new facilities and have you all help prioritize those relative to the other kinds of requests. Yeah, um, that would because be really I think great. that's the that's really the that's really the discussion. And, and again, I know that this particular constituency has been very vocal to the commission. But um, our staff can put together a list of <laughs> a number of other kinds of recreation and park facilities that we get um, that we get requests for. And I think that's really the, the role that you all have to help decide what those priorities should be. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I'm well aware that it's often um, a loud minority that gets the attention, but we don't really know um, the other competing factors, I guess, at this point. Thank you. Sheila, don't we have on the schedule that we're gonna review that capital improvement plan in the coming months? Yeah, as I said, I think probably in January or February. I, I just, um, I have the same sort of questions, but, but I also um, am cautious to recognize that there was a very lengthy process that um, there was a subcommittee that went through and the commission reviewed it and gave input. Um, at this point, I think Chair Massey and I were the only commissioners uh, on the commission at that time. It wasn't that long ago, but maybe that just makes me feel old. 
Um, but, uh, but it was a very long and lengthy process that was in recognition of a multi-year, multi-decade plan or goal. Um, and, and so one of the unfortunate or challenging things about government and participatory government is that things move very slowly. Um, and, and you, it's difficult to change all of the priorities of uh, something when you've gone through a pretty significant um, community outreach uh, without going back to that. So that, you know, like as Commissioner Walling said, the, sometimes the, the vocal one gets the attention. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult balance and I, I don't have the answer for it. Um, I think that the current community of skateboarders that we hear from have brought up a lot of really um, enlightening and, and really um, strong arguments, uh, but they weren't here when we were doing the whole process before seeking community engagement. And, and I don't know how to reconcile that. Um, it's, it's not fair to them to say, well, you missed the boat, um, but it's not fair to the community that set a whole list of priorities to bump any one of those priorities for a new um, group. So I think that is part of the ongoing challenge that uh, Sheila faces when, when she gets calls for pickleball or skateboarding or, or what have you. Yeah, I appreciate that. I, I mean, I just, I think I just renewed my term. So it's been five years at least. And I, that's the first time I'm hearing that there was a subcommittee that went through all this. So maybe, um, maybe that's just something that uh, we could hear about when the when it comes up again. The commit. I'm um, sorry. The when the capital improvement plan comes up, maybe we can um, at least see what the results of that prioritization were. So and I'll are, just say, I, as a new commissioner, I would really appreciate that as well. Eric, so you I just want to. About... I just want to be clear. I'm sorry, Chris. No, I just want to be clear because the plan that I believe Eric is referring to was the recreation facility strategic plan oh, oh, that was oh. very directed towards our existing recreation facilities. So our I rec see. centers and our pools. That's, and we have not concluded that process yet. And that's also gonna be part of the discussion that we'll be bringing back to um, the commission. That study did not look at other park amenities like tennis courts or skate parks or community gardens or dog parks or any of those kinds of things. And so um, there are sort of two parallel paths that we're looking at in terms of, of um, potential facility improvements for the future. One is very much focused on our facilities, our rec centers and our pools. And the other one that we have not done an in-depth analysis or study of is really what are those other park amenities like the things that I just mentioned. Okay, thanks for the clarification. Thanks. Uh, Sheila, it, it, uh, I, I don't want to take up a lot of, of additional time on this, but I want to come back to the beginning of Commissioner Wolnick's question, uh, and that is um, this, these requests that we get for listening session uh, my understanding of uh, commission process and procedure, and it's not just our commission that operates this way, is that a session like, like what we keep being asked for is just outside the commission's purview, um, that we, we are, are not constituted to have uh, sort of open-ended discussions with members of the public in, in a formal meeting. And, this comes up uh, repeatedly that the, the public doesn't really understand the role of our commission or, or really any of the other commissions in terms of what, what we do. And we're, we're hearing people telling us, well, why, you know, why aren't you responding to us? Why do you just sit there quietly and you, you never respond to us? Well, there's a reason for that. And I, I just wanted to, to bring out that part of, of her question, because I think it was a very good question. Well, and I think that's why, I, and I think you're correct, um, because I think that really the, again, the context of, um, 
of saying that we need certain facilities, recreation facilities in, in San Mateo is in that larger context of where do you wanna prioritize your money for capital improvements in the future? That's the discussion that you have. Um, and, I, and I acknowledge that that could be frustrating for people, um, but again, if, if, you, if the commission was to dedicate a session for skateboarders, then I would certainly suggest that you dedicate a suggest or a session for pickleboard or pickleball courts or for you know bike tracks or whatever those individual interests might be. And that's why it's important to put those in the context of trying to come up with a plan relative to the priorities for capital improvements. That's really where that discussion happens. Thank, thank you. Thank you for that. One other question very quickly, and that is uh, there was a public meeting uh, last week on the, um, on the East Hillsdale Park, and I just wanted a, a quick bit of feedback on how that went. So we had a really good session with the neighbors from East Hillsdale Park. Um, I would say that um, based upon our proposed designs that we over-designed for what the neighborhood wanted. Um, they want to maintain the neighborhood feel of the park. They want very simple improvements. Um, I thought the suggestions that they raised to us were really very genuine, very heartfelt. Um, and I think some of the things that we sometimes hear from, um, from users about things that are really important to them may not necessarily be as important to a smaller community and neighborhood park. Um, so I think we got some really good feedback. I think we're gonna go back to the drawing board a little bit um, and um, we'll come back and, and provide uh, another design that I think better meets what we heard last week. Good, okay, thank you. Anything else before we call it a night? Uh, hearing nothing, I'll declare the meeting adjourned. Thank you all very much. This was a very good meeting. Uh, Thank you. Look forward. Have a happy, happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving to all. Thanks. Happy Thanksgiving to everybody. And Have a good night. Thanksgiving. Good night. Good night. Good night.